We have to awaken to righteousness. As you see the things that are unfolding, the things that are taking place through this time of the coronavirus, of COVID-19, of the Wuhan virus, of, of whatever you want to say that it is, if you read in the Old Testament, it's a pestilence. If you read in the New Testament, he says that there's wars and rumors of wars that you're going to see. There's pestilences that will come. There's famines, but it is not the end, but this is the beginning. This is the beginning of the New Testament church in the last days. On the day of Pentecost began the New Testament church. And as it began, he said, the latter days are greater than the early days. So it is my belief, and it has been for my whole life, that I'm going to see the glory of the Lord in and through the church of the living God. I believe that I'm going to see His sons and daughters be led by His Spirit that are going to go into all the world and they're going to preach the gospel to every living creature. And as they do that, we're going to see a regeneration that has taken place within the church. And that regeneration is going to bring about a revival that I believe that is going to take place. It's going to be the third great awakening. I believe it has already begun because the church is beginning to wake up. It's something that if you ever listen to me preach, I've been screaming it as loud as I could scream it for the church to wake up. You're listening to Heart of the Father, a podcast from Pastor Eugene Weldon. For more information about our ministry and how you can get involved, text the code Kingdom Life to 94000. That's Kingdom Life to 94000. Welcome back to Heart of the Father. My name is Court Weldon, and with me as always is my dad, Pastor Eugene Weldon. This morning we are going to talk about awakening to righteousness, uh, what it means for the church to wake up. Well, this is something that the Lord really put on my heart several years ago. I had uh, went through the seventh of seven knee surgeries. They they explained it that the nerves were so ra- uh, uh, tore up and, and so ragged that they really had trouble getting me out of pain. And a lot of times when I take pain medicine, it, it, it goes the other direction and it, and it really wires me. It caused me to get angry and on edge. And and uh, so I was up for several weeks just praying and seeking the Lord and pacing and uh, on crutches and, you know, and, and as I was in the midst of praying, we, we came up on the 10th anniversary uh, of the Twin Towers of the terroristic attack of them falling. And, and I described... 9-11 of 2001, uh, I described that the church woke up for about five minutes on the first Sunday after the Twin Towers bombing or being blown up. We, uh, we had our, our church buildings were full of people. And on the first Sunday, I pulled out where Jesus said that this is not the end. These are birth pains. You'll see pestilences. You'll see wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and all these things will take place. And I, I shared that day that this is not the end. And this is just the beginning of things that's taking place in the end times. And I could literally see people in the room that hadn't been there in a long time, but the room was packed full. And, and they literally wiped their, forebrow, their foreheads and their brows and like it was, they went, wow, we made it through that one. You know, and and then all of a sudden everybody went to back to business as usual. Well, we fast forward to ten years on the tenth anniversary, and that is when the seventh of the seven knee surgeries took place. And as I was, you know, I couldn't eat and I wasn't sleeping and and just crying out to God. I came to a place that I said, God, I, I I'll never walk into a platform again. I'll never step up on a podium and and speak again. Until you give me a word for your church, mm-hmm. till you give me a word for the rest of my life of what I'm to, to do and say to your church. Right. I need that uh, prophetic vision, if you would, of, of the rest of my life. And and this had gone on for days, and and it came down to Sunday morning, and Sadie and and all four of the boys left and went to the church building and. 
I did not leave. I didn't go. And I just sat there and I said, Lord, I, I'm i not going. They'll just have to go on without me because I will not go until you give me a word. And I heard that still small voice, and this had been going on for weeks, you know, and I wasn't hearing anything. And very plainly, I heard the Lord say, my church is asleep. Mm-hmm. I want you to wake my church up. Mm-hmm. And, and so the scripture that came to my mind immediately is, In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, he says, Be not deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. And so as I made my way out to the building and I walked in and I just sat down on the front row when I come in a side door, like I said, I was on crutches and and Sadie leaned over and she said, Eugene, the worship team is just stalling. You're late and, and it's time to start. Mm. And so I eased up there and, and I gave the prophetic word that God says that my church is asleep and we must awaken to righteousness. Right. It's not our righteousness. He says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. And we've got to come to that full saving knowledge of the truth that it's about Jesus, it ain't about us. Right. Our righteousness, as he says, is filthy rags. And so it's his righteousness, mm-hmm. and he's made us righteous. He's made us right standing with him. Yeah. He's freed us from guilt of sin. He's freed us from sin. And so we're to walk in the righteousness of Jesus on this earth. Mm-hmm. And, and he addresses evil company corrupts good morals. Okay, and he tells us that in 1 John, that the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, these are all things of the world, and the world is passing away. Mm -hmm. I've spoken many times through the years that God told me there was three things that I would deal with in the church of the living God, and it was complacency, it was compromise, and it was commitment, the lack thereof, that it was in the world and that the world had infiltrated the church. Mm. And so, therefore, the church is asleep. And you start looking, and several times the Apostle Paul is the one that spoke about awaken to righteousness. And in and in, in, in Romans chapter 13, verse 11, he said, And do this, knowing the time that now it is, high, high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust. Mm -hmm. Through the years, I've taught about God's grace. And I've taught about that we are saved by his grace, right. not of works, lest anyone should boast. And I've taught about that, that all of our sin or under, his sin is under the blood of Jesus. And so that we have been made righteous for him, by him. And, and Paul said, just because I, I've been made righteous, does that give me a law to sin? May it never be that way. But I see much of the church that is asleep that they don't have that full saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus, that as he is, so are we in this world. Yep. That to walk as he walked, talk as he talked, that we're to be about the Father's business. And in this, he tells us that we're to walk as light. We're to be that light. We're to be that salt. Yep. Okay, we're to go in all the world and make disciples. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's about us going. It's not about us coming to church building. Okay, and so I believe that, that a big part of Christianity, a huge part of the church, they just go, if you would, the blind leading the blind. They go every Sunday to a building, they yep. sit there and they hear a message, and then they go back to same old, same old. They just go about living their lives, not understanding that they're to awaken to righteousness. Mm-hmm that they are to walk as Jesus walked, that they are his representative. And so it, it is, as a minister that's been preaching this and teaching this for the biggest part of my life, at times it get very frustrating because people 
say, man, you, you're just too uh, intent yep. or, or intense, yep. you know, and, and you just press on this so much. But it's serious. It is a very serious time. Mm-hmm. 30 years ago, a friend of mine gave me a, a painting. And the painting was a picture of a cowboy on a horse. And there was storm clouds all, right, all around him. And he's riding, he's whooping and riding as hard as he can run and hard as his horse can run because the storm is coming up on him. I have felt like that most of my life. Mm-hmm. Storms are inevitable. Storms are going to come. And, and we are to be about the Father's business, but we're so busy yep. taking care of business instead of the Father's business. Mm. And so it's a huge deal that, that we are to awaken, to wake up, okay? Because we are allowing our nation, as terms that some people have called it, going to hell in a handbag. <laughs> we've, we've gone about separating ourselves from, from all of the, uh, in politics, in education, mm-hmm. in, in medicine, in yeah. every area of life. In the, we've, we've separated ourselves. Yep. And we've attended church instead of being the church. Right. And so this word about waking to righteousness is about that. Mm -hmm. He called his disciples and and told them, I send you out. Now you go, you raise the dead, you heal the sick, you cleanse the lepers. Right. Okay. He told us in Luke that we are to occupy till he returns. He told us to do business till he returns. Right. Okay. It is our responsibility to awaken to righteousness, mm-hmm. we are supposed to be over the education system. Yep. We're supposed to be over the government, the government systems yeah, of God's, the world. Yep. Mm-hmm. In Isaiah 2, 2, he tells us that the mountain of the Lord will be over all the mountains of mm-hmm. the world. And all those mountains that, that I've talked about in the past, the right. seven mountains of influence, arts and entertainment, mm-hmm. God gave the arts to his sons and daughters. Mm-hmm. But the world has perverted it. Right. Okay, and so all of those things, we are supposed to be awakened and awake, knowing that that it's high time that we stop living for ourselves. Right. We're to live for him. Mm -hmm. It's about him. It's for him. It's through him. Yeah. It's all his, and we're supposed to be about the Father's business. Yeah, and in in a lot of ways, if you really think about it from the cultural relevance of the church, there is none. There, there really is no driving force that Christianity should be allied in this world. Uh, that's the the whole thing is it's it's almost like the people have been convinced to be on life support that they're not actually their voice doesn't matter what they do doesn't matter as long as you come in on Sunday mornings and and then the rest of your life is totally separated from that quote unquote church experience. Um, but when I think about waking up as well, I, I think of Ephesians 5.14 that says that for the light makes everything visible. This is why it says, awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead and Christ will give you light. And if you go ahead and you read those verses up above it, mm-hmm. if you start in verse 8, he, he says, for you were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Mm. Walk as children of light. And then he says, for the fruit of the Spirit, it is in all goodness. Yep. Okay, it's his goodness. It is in all righteousness. It's his righteousness, and it is in all truth. Mm-hmm. Okay? It's the truth that you know that makes you free. Yep. Okay, and he told us when the Dead Sea Scrolls, the new ones were found in, in March of, of 21. Mm-hmm. He said, I'm sick of you lying to one another. Right. Bring truth, justice, and peace into your gates, into your arena of influence. Yep. And, and he says, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Yep. Well, I don't believe that a big part of the church even cares what's acceptable, mm-hmm. Lord. Mm-hmm. No, and especially if they're asleep. I, I, I see it in, in a way that it, it's almost like when 
light is shed on a subject. It's like you've been in a dark room and you've been asleep. And if somebody turns on the light, you're like, turn that off. I don't want to see that. I want to see it. It's too much. But God actually created us for our eyes to adjust to the light and be in the light because there's, you can see in the light. Because he says to be the light. But because the church is asleep and they've been in the dark for so long, they have not allowed themselves to adjust and accommodate the light. They've, exactly. They've been more comfortable in the dark. In the dark. And he told us those things that are done in the darkness will be, will be shouted from the rooftop. Right. And I believe that that's the day and the time we're in right now yeah. that exposure is taking place. Mm-hmm. The dream that I had several years ago before in, 20, in December of 2019 of the landslide, God said there's a storm coming. Mm-hmm. Okay, I didn't know it was COVID, but he said those of my sons and daughters that run to me are going to be safe. Right. But those who trust in their own, they're going to be overwhelmed. Okay, if you keep reading in the text that you brought up of, out of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11, he says, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, mm-hmm. but rather expose them. Yep. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. Yeah. For whatever makes Manifest is light. There, then he says, therefore, awake, mm-hmm. you sleep. That is the day and the time that we live in. Yep. And I believe that the motives of the heart are being exposed right now. Mm-hmm. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. speaks. Yep. Okay. Out of the heart, evil comes out. Mm-hmm. And so right now, I believe the church has to wake up. And, and it's something I've been screaming. You know, yep. you've heard it a huge part of your life. But I begin to s- scream it on, on the 10th anniversary of September 11th. Mm-hmm. And as I begin to go back and I begin to read and, and study, I begin to hear that from many other uh, ministers that were saying the church is asleep. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's a place that I truly believe we're in. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's something that, that I get stirred up very much. I get adamant about, okay, I, I quit playing church a long time ago. <laughs> mm-hmm. And and it's a message that I've preached the biggest part of my life mm-hmm. is that we don't attend church, we as the church. Right. And so if we're going to be the church, we got to wake up. Mm-hmm. And, and one of the things that is heartbreaking is to see how many people blatantly refuse and do not want to awaken to this righteousness. They, they would rather stay in their comfortable bubble then face the truth of reality. But I think this is the season that we're in. There's a hunger, I believe, especially in some of the younger generations. And you and I've had this conversation that we're, we're tired of the fake church. We're tired of pretending that something it should be confined into the spaces of a Sunday morning service, because if that's all there is, that's not enough. And God knows that's not enough because that was never what he intended. never his intention. No. Uh, and, and so, there has to be some way that people start taking accountability for what we've made of church and, and start rerouting what that looks like for the future generations, because culturally speaking, it can't continue as it is because it's, it's all falling apart right in front of our eyes. We can see it happening everywhere. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. You know what? 27 years ago, we, we started having, corporate meetings in Jacksboro mm-hmm. and we were meeting in the Lions club building and we, we had, we're meeting for several months and, and I got a call one night from a bunch of people and, and they said, we're having a, a meeting tonight and we'd like for you to attend. And I said, well, what kind of meeting are you having? And they said, well, we're at, we, we formed a building committee and, and we want you to come. And so I went and I listened to what they had to say. And they said, uh, we, we want to build a building. We want to build our church. And I began the teaching at the very first day was Matthew 21, when Jesus cleansed the temple. Right. Okay, and I did a real simple teaching that says that Jesus made the temple a house of purity. Mm. Then he said, he made my house should be called a house of prayer. So he made the temple a house of prayer. Then the blind and lame came to him and he healed them all. He made it a house of power. Mm. Then the children cried out and said, Hosanna, you got nice. So he made it as a real simple teaching. Yep. We don't attend church. We is a church. Right. 
We're to be a, a temple of purity. We're to allow him to purify us, to purge us, to get rid of the world's way of thinking, the world's way of doing things. Yeah. We're to walk and pray, be in a house of prayer that we pray about anything and everything and for everyone. And, yep. and we bring heaven here on this earth. My kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yep. So we're that house of prayer. And then we perform that house of power, his, his manifested glory, that, that manifested power, that manifested goodness, that manifested presence of God is working in and through our lives. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then we, we're that house of praise. When do we praise him? Continually. Always. About all things. Yep. We continually praise him and, and rejoice in him. Okay, and and so I shared that message. I told everybody at that meeting, I said, y'all come back on Sunday morning and I'll share again. And I got up and I stood and I shared that meeting. There were a hundred people in that room that morning because I put out a hundred chairs and every chair was full. Mm -hmm. And when I finished my message, it was the exact same message I began with 27 years ago. And I said, now, if you have a problem saying I don't attend church, I is the church. There's the door. And there's buildings all over town that says church. If you have to have your identity in a building mm. that is called church, you are welcome to go and find one. Okay, that's the way I feel. Our identity can't be in a building. Right. It's got to be an understanding that we are the temple of God. Yep. What do you not know? Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit yep. of God. Yep. He says, I'm building together a group of people, mm-hmm. not made with hands, I'm mm-hmm. building a holy habitation in the spirit yep. with my sons and daughters. And as I said, there's the door. Next Sunday, I came up and I put up tables and I set up 100 chairs. And I tell everybody I grew the church from 100 to two. <laughs> and somebody says, oh, my gosh, you grew at 200 people in one week? No, there was two people there the next week. Yeah. Well, <laughs> What does that say? Right. We want our identity in a building. We want our identity in an institution. Okay, the church was started as a spiritual church. Hmm. It was a spiritual church that was rocking the world. Yep. It was going from house to house, and the, the gospel was spreading mm-hmm. unbelievably, right. exponentially. Every day, they were adding to the church. Mm-hmm. And it had nothing to do with the building. No, it had everything to do with the truth of Jesus. That's all it was about. Yep. And what he set them free from and what he delivered them. And 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 that's the thing too that is heartbreaking when you think about especially talking about the church being asleep, but in a lot of ways the church is on life support. They're barely hanging on because Jesus told us greater works than these will you also do. He's the one that told us to go out and be, go out and do take on that representation because the Holy spirit is supposed to be living within us working the same power, but the church does not believe it as a whole. And as a rule, now there are people that I believe that have tapped into that and truly begin walking out miracle filled lives. And, but, but as a whole, the church in America and the church in the world is not seeing signs, miracles, and wonders follow them everywhere that they go. And that is the commission of Christ, that we should see those things. Well, in Isaiah, I think it's 55, he, he said, my ways are not your ways. Yep. My thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Lord. Okay, my attitude is, if we have an anointing from the Holy One to know all things, if by his divine power we've been given all things that pertain to life and godliness, that's Second Peter 1, 3, 1 John 2, 20, he says, you have an anointing from the Holy One to know all things. He says, I'll send my spirit to indwell you and guide you into all truth. Okay, so if if the church, if God says, my ways are not your ways, mm-hmm. my thoughts are not your thoughts, why not? Yeah. If he sent the same spirit to raise Jesus from the dead, then why not? Right. This is a hard question that has to be asked. Mm-hmm. Why not? Yep. Because I hear ministers all the time say, well, you know, God's ways are not our way. His ways are higher than ours. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Why not? Mm-hmm. If he is the one, his spirit is guiding you. If his spirit is directing you, then that's a hard question you've got to ask yourself. Right. Why not? Yeah. Okay. That same spirit is living within me. Mm-hmm. And he says, I'll guide you in all truth. 
So why aren't his ways your ways? Why aren't his thoughts your thoughts? Right. What are you listening to? Yeah, I mean, it's it's that, that conversation of who has bewitched you? Who, who has convinced you that you are powerless? Who has convinced yes. you? And, and, and sadly speaking, a lot of it is ministers who don't know the gospel themselves have convinced people that they have no authority. They don't, have, they don't know the truth. And that was in, in uh, Galatians 3. He said, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you right. from obeying the truth? Did you begin in the spirit to now be walking in the flesh, mm. to be unjustified by the flesh, mm-hmm. by the works? Mm-hmm. Okay, and that's what he was addressing because it was about doing. Okay, if you read in Mark 7, Jesus himself says, because of your traditions, you make my word to no avail. Yep. You would rather hold on to your tradition of man than to obey me. Hmm. Okay, and so for me, I get, man, I, I get wired up on this. <laughs> I get fired up about this mm-hmm. because I believe a huge part of the church is asleep today. Yep. I believe there is an awakening taking place. I believe that I, I begin to see it. I believe that the decade of the of 20s, 2020 we began, it was the decade of, of 5780 in the Hebrew. And 80 means pay, the voice of God. Yep. Eight is new beginnings. And I believe that God's, his grace is upon his church through the Holy Spirit of God for a new beginning, mm-hmm. for an awakening to take place. There has to be an awakening of the church. It has to awaken to righteousness right. of, of knowing that Jesus paid it all, did it all, and now he went and said it to the right hand of the Father and said, now y'all go. Right. Y'all go and be. Mm-hmm. Y'all go and do. Greater works these you'll be able to do because I go into the Father. Yep. Well, why aren't we seeing those? Yep. Well, because we've made an institutional church that you attend and you come and right. hear a nice message. Yeah, and I, for me, what what that starts with is people that are beginning to wake up. It's it always starts with repentance and recognizing you've allowed yourself to be deceived, not even on purpose, not even knowingly. It's it's not even about something that you've done or you haven't done, but it's a fact that your mind has to change. There has to be some light switch that you turn on in your brain that says, "Wow, I have limited God, and I've limited myself because of that." Well, repentance means to change your mind. It literally means to change your mind. Yep. Okay. And so if you have not changed your mind, you haven't repented. Yeah. Okay. And so that's something that we have to, you talked a few minutes ago about that the church was on life support. I've been sharing for many years that it is anemic. Yeah. There is no power. Yeah. Yeah, And it's because we have separated ourselves from the world. We have separated ourselves from God. Mm -hmm. We're not even inviting his spirit to come and move in our midst because we want to control our 30-minute meetings. We want to control everything that's being said, everything that's being done. Okay, and so if we're going to talk about waking up and the church awakening, I think it's a serious and it's a hard thought that, that each and every person, and I, and I call the ministers out. Yeah. Because many of them have lived in the tradition of man. And if your thoughts are not God's thoughts and your ways are not God's ways, then you've got to ask a hard question. Yeah. Why aren't they? Yeah. What have I believed? What have I bought into? Mm-hmm. What have I sold out to? And most of them unknowingly. Totally. Okay, and, and what's bad is uh, I believe that Satan only has one tool, and it's deception. Mm. It's us, him deceiving us to believe a lie and to, to, to walk in his lies. Well, what if a person for 30 years of their life had bought into the lie and, and have, have based everything that they do about on attendance? Mm. You know, are you willing to die to all of that? Well, and (laughs) it's funny that you say that because attendance one day a week is not attendance every second, every hour, every moment, every fiber of your being, being attentive to the Holy Spirit. That's supposed to be 24-7. Correct. So if, if if you really want to have the conversation about attendance, you should be attending being the church. You should be tending that soil every moment you get an opportunity to, every breath. 
So if, if, if they want to have that argument, that's the truth of the matter is it's Sunday morning should be an after effect of what you've been doing all week. It should be the time that you come to rejoice together as the body and say, look what happened this week. Look what God did this week. Come and celebrate. Yeah. That's what it should be about. Not about come, come get your <laughs> communion, come get your 30 minute message and go home feeling better about yourself. What did you do with the time you were given? Exactly. I believe that every waking moment, it should be about, Father, what do you want? Mm. Okay, how do you do your job? Yeah. Well, you do it as unto him rather than a man. You don't know how to do your job the best way possible. You say, Father, how do I do this? You know all things. Holy Spirit, guide me. How do I do it better? So I get on the, I mean, this is one of those deals that I get wired about. Right. I get, it's, it's like when they give me those drugs and my brain flops over and it goes the other way. You know, instead of putting me to sleep, it, it jacks me up. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I have to be careful about it because you, you asked me to, to share on <laughs> the church waking up. Yep. Uh, it is something that I want to scream from the rooftops. It's a necessity. It yes. is in the day and the time that we live in with the amount of turmoil going on in the world, with the amount of chaos that we see on the news daily, not just in America, but worldwide. If the church does not take accountability for what we've been given, and we don't take accountability for this time and this season, then we're failing everyone. And that's a huge word right there, accountability. Yep. And that's a huge thing that, that many people don't want accountability. Mm. They don't want to awaken to righteousness. They don't want to wake up and, and be held accountable in the way they're living their lives, the way that he talks right here. You know, we go about our business, and you can't tell the difference between the church and the world. Yeah. Because we act just like them. Mm. So with all that said, what is our next step for people? How do you, yeah, how do scream you scream it real loud? Wake <laughs> up. No, it's, but it's true. Yes. Wake up. But those of, that have listened and hear it and they, they want, to see more, they want to experience more. What what do we do? Well, I believe that the you mentioned a while ago. One of the things that I share is that recognition has to come before repentance can ever come. Mm. You got to recognize your need. Okay, if you recognize, man, my ways are not God's ways. My thoughts aren't His thoughts. Mm -hmm. I spend all my time meditating on everything else but God. Okay, well, the first thing you got to recognize that that's not the way it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's supposed to be about every waking hour. How can I be about the Father's business right. and everything that I'm doing and saying today? Mm -hmm. Paul addressed it in Colossians twice. He says, whatever you choose to do in word and deed, do it all in the name of the Father. Mm -hmm. You know, and then he says again, whatever you choose to do, do it with all of your heart. And so if I recognize, man, I had, that hadn't been my life, then immediately I say, Father, forgive me. Right. Well, it, changing your mind is real simple. You repent, and then you, you go a different direction. Yeah. You begin to, to take one step at a time. It's that proverbial leading elephant, <laughs> one bite at a time. Mm -hmm. You begin by recognizing and repenting. Well, then God's able to bring about the reconciliation and the restoration there has to be a restoration within his church mm -hmm. of his sons and daughters walking in, in, in that power and that authority that he called us to. Mm -hmm. We've been all called to walk in his power. We're all called to walk in his authority yep. because Jesus said, the last thing he said to his church was all authority has been given unto me. Now you go. Yep. He yep. gave us that authority to go and, and, and walk. Worthy of him and everything we say and do. Oh, well, Father, we want to receive that. We want to receive all of that authority. And and so, Father, I just thank you for those that are listening, uh, that you have awoke, awoken something within them, Father, in their spirit that says, yes, I recognize that there has to be a change within me. There has to be a change within the way that I proceed uh, and so, Father, we just thank you for that. We thank you that as those light switches are going off all around the world, Father, that people are coming to the full knowledge 
of who you are and who you've called them to be and what that even looks like, Father, only you know. But I just thank you that that as people begin to awaken to righteousness and awaken to the fullness of who you are and what you've put within each and every single one of us, Father, I just thank you that you give us the direction and the diligence to sow the seeds of righteousness. And I just praise you for it. And we just thank you for those listening. And and we just say, go and be, go and do all that he has for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening to this week's podcast. If you'd like to support our ministry financially and help us keep making content just like this, text the code Kingdom Life to 94000. That's Kingdom Life to 94000. Imagine yourself walking through the streets of Jerusalem, seeing the garden tomb, praying in the garden of Gethsemane, feeling the excitement of the crowd in the old city. Imagine touching the western wall as you lift your voice in prayer. You can see Jerusalem, the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea, and much more. Shalom, I am Omer Eshel, CEO of the Bible Comes to Life Travel and Education Center. Being a fourth generation Israeli and living my life in Israel, I know the impact that this holy land has on people from all walks of life. There is just something about seeing the places that we read in the Bible day in and day out. Places where Jesus spent his childhood, where he taught, preached, and from where he called his disciples. We have planned your itinerary very carefully to offer you the absolute best educational tour. You will visit Megiddo and overlook the Valley of Armageddon. We will analyze the battle with David Slugolite from above the battlefield itself. We will visit Magdala, home of Mary of Magdala, and we will see the temple where Jesus would have preached. Visiting the city of David and the temple steps and walking through the underground rabbinical tunnels will give you a new perspective as you watch the Bible comes to life before your very eyes. From the mountain plateau of Masada, the last Jewish stronghold which was destroyed in the year 73 AD, you will overlook the lowest place on earth, the Dead Sea. You will have time to float in this amazing and unique body of water. This 10-day tour gives you an incredible overview of the Holy Land. All costs are included in deluxe hotels, entrances to all sites, breakfast and dinners daily, transportation on a luxury bus, specially trained guides, tips, and so much more. A visit to the Holy Land of Israel is a journey that many people dream of experiencing at some point in their lives. It is the time. Okay, guys, we could not be more excited. We just found out starting March 1st of 2022 that all travel restrictions have been lifted from Israel. What this means is that you no longer have to have a vaccine passport or a booster shot to be able to enter into the country. We are so pumped for this. It means that we can continue uh, taking churches and family and, and all the above back to the Holy Land with our ministry partners, The Bible Comes to Life. Those of you who have spent any time with our family or with our church, you know how much we love Israel and we love getting to take people to the places where Jesus walked. Uh, It is truly a life-changing experience. Uh, If you would like more information on these trips, we encourage you, reach out to us. We have plenty of information we can give you. We can get you connected to Omer and to the team at The Bible Comes to Life. We specialize in group trips specifically. Um, We really try to help pastors and churches and and businesses reach a goal of 25 or more uh, to be able to travel to the Holy Land. And if this is something you're interested in, if it's a dream trip that you've been wanting to go, but you haven't been able to travel due to the restrictions, um, this is something that you are now able to do. All restrictions have been lifted. All travel is now totally open. And so if this is something you're interested in, you would like to know when we're taking another trip or when uh, when this is available to you, we encourage you text the code Holy Land. That's all one word to 94000. That's Holy Land to 94000.